I think you'll be able to handle the trunk without a porter. Excuse me, sir. Is this your left luggage ticket? Yes, it is. It's too heavy for you to carry yourself. Would you like me to get you a port? That won't be necessary. Jenkins here will... He's gone. Who is gone? Jenkins. You are under arrest, sir. Uh, I'm what? Anything you say will be taken down and used in evidence against you. This is a dreadful case. A body found in a trunk in Victoria Station. They've arrested a young man by the name of John Courtney. The arresting officer was Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard, who was able to make the arrest in less than 24 hours. I must say Lestrade moved quickly this time. But not more quickly than Mr. Courtney's fiance. Does not anything about a fiance here? She's young, very attractive, titled and wealthy. You know her? No, her name is Helen. What do you mean you don't know her and her name is Helen? I sometimes have the impression, Watson, that you don't trust me. What on earth has trust got to do with it? You make these wild, outlandish statements and... Excuse me. My name is... Lady Helen Fairfax, please come in. Good heavens. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes, and you've come to see me about your fiancé, Mr. John Courtney. Yes. Your photograph was in the tapper last week when your engagement to Mr. Courtney was announced. May I present Dr. Watson? How do you do? Even Lestrade could have done it. Please, sit down. The victim was a milliner by trade, living in Peckham, by the name of Josephine Potts. She was a kept woman. Kept by whom? The neighbors say a mystery man, but they never got a good look at him. But there's no question it was Courtney. Who you believe to be the murderer? Well, he had the ticket, we had the body. You mean a man places a dead girl in a trunk and goes back to claim the body? Well, I know it sounds odd when you say it like that. Well, how else could you say it? Well, he must have forgotten something. What? Something he forgot, some clue. What explanation did he give, Lestrade? He works in an art gallery. He said his employer sent him down here to collect a trunk of antiques. <laughs> they make up any kind of story. Well, what did the employer say? And he confirms he sent Courtney here to collect a box of antiques. So the ticket was exchanged by someone else? No, it wasn't. Courtney had two tickets. One his employer gave him, and one for the trunk with the body in it. Now, if anyone made a mistake, it was Courtney by handing in the wrong ticket. How did he explain the second ticket? He didn't. He couldn't. But we found it in his pocket. What's his employer's name, Lestrade? Werner. Hugo Werner. That's it. He has a gallery in Clifford Street. That's the place. Thank you, Lestrade. Incidentally, did you arrest his accomplice as well? Accomplice? What accomplice? Trunk with a body in it could hardly be handled by one man. Well, he could have hired a porter. Oh, he had a porter with him from the gallery. But he ran away when he saw the police. Did you find him? Yes, I questioned him at the gallery. He admitted that he was frightened and ran away. But that, that's not unusual. He was a very simple man. 
Well, that would explain how Courtney was going to move the body. Yes. It doesn't explain why he wanted to move the body. No, it doesn't. What do you think of this, Watson? Atrocious. I rather like it. You can't really be serious. I am serious. I need to say that you really believe that that bit of rubbish has any aesthetic or artistic merit? I just said I liked it. Why? Because it's heavy. Two, two, one, B, Baker Street. Certainly, sir. And the name? Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, Mr. Holmes, of course. It's rather splendid. A masterpiece. I'm buying it for my good friend, Dr. Watson, here. He's a connoisseur of fine art. Well, that's most generous of you, Holmes. But don't you think something a little smaller? My dear fellow, don't thank me now. I should like to have kept it a secret, but it's not one that can easily be concealed. Am I right, Mr. Werner? It does have uh, substance. There you are, Watson. It does have uh, substance. Well, I wouldn't argue with that. When you say early delivery... Later today will do. I will need a couple of porters. Or one good, strong one. I'm afraid my best man, Jenkins, is away at the moment. It was he who, uh... Who was with Courtney? Yes. How extraordinary. Yes. The shock, you know. I gave him a few days off. Quite. You didn't want the police to question Jenkins. They already have. Tell me, Mr. Werner, that box of antiques which you sent Courtney to collect. Yes? Is that it? Yes. The police have only just released it. So no one's opened it yet? No. What do you think of that, Watson? Mm -hmm. Well, I think... That Pretty heavy, I should think. Oh, I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Werner. We must not waste any more of your valuable time. I will deliver to you as soon as I possibly can, Mr. Holmes. So long as it's there for Dr. Watson's birthday. Which is? At the stroke of midnight, tonight. Dr. Watson is sentimental about birthdays. Tell Jenkins to come up here immediately. Yes, sir. Happy birthday and many more of them. They come round all too frequently without you inventing any more. But I will drink in celebration of that ghastly thing not arriving. Indeed. Mm. Mr. Werner must have run short of porters. And Mr. Jenkins, we should all be glad, is resting. Why send this tire of strength to pick up a case which anyone can lift with ease? They sent a strong man, you think, because they knew that the body was in the trunk? No. I believe we've fallen into an obvious trap. We've been thinking of Jenkins as an unusually strong man. But he is, or so we've been told. It would be more logical to assume that Jenkins was sent because he could be trusted. Well, what has that got to do with strength? Nothing. But it takes no strength at all to slip a small ticket into a man's pocket. The second ticket? Yes. And then he ran away. His job was finished. The police were about to arrest Courtney. The perfect reason to run away. Thank you. The landlady says that Jenkins has gone off for a few days in the country. Say with his sister. At Henley. That's what the art dealer Werner told us. 
Jenkins decided to leave after he returned from work yesterday, after we spoke to Vernon. You mean Vernon lied to us? Yes. And it will take a very large trunk to hold Jenkins. His sister said that he fished this stretch. Would that be him, do you think? Wrong size, but let's inquire. Good day to you. You know Mr. Jenkins by any chance? Shh. Quite. Right. You wouldn't happen to know Mr. Jenkins. He was staying with his sister in the village and... I got him! I got him! Watson, we've just found Mr. Jenkins. <laughs> from the prison. John is being very brave, but... Lady Helen, you really mustn't distress yourself. Is there a chance? The trial is to be held in two weeks' time. I know it. Please, sit down, Lady Helen. Tell me, how long have you known Mr. Werner? About five years, I suppose. He was introduced by a cousin of mine. And what was the extent of your relationship? We're just friends. Mr. Werner once, well, courted me. But when I met John, I knew he was the man I was going to marry. I see. Mr. Werner has been such a good friend to us both. John has no particular training. It was kind of Hugo to employ him. Quite. I wish I could explain to you, Mr. Holmes. It is John's bewilderment which is so pathetic. He knows nothing about this girl who was murdered. He swears it. John Courtney presented that ticket at the left luggage office. That will be the thrust of that case. But it was given to him by Hugo Werner. No. The ticket Werner gave to him, or says he gave to him, was still in Mr. Courtney's pocket. But the porter must know. The porter was drowned yesterday. Extensive bruising and contusions on back of head cause of death, drowning. Why do you think it was Werner? Because it was he who killed the girl, and he who has fixed the blame on Courtney. How? By giving him a ticket which Courtney thought was for a case of antiques. But Werner gave him the ticket for the antiques. We found it in Courtney's pocket. Well, the fact that we found it in Courtney's pocket does not mean that Werner gave it to him. Who did that? No one gave it to him. Someone put it there. Who? Jenkins, the porter. So it was Werner. I was the cause of Jenkins' death. You? Werner realized my inquiries would lead me to Jenkins, so he got rid of him. How are we going to prove that? We must go back to the beginning. We must ask questions of those who live beyond this world. What? I refer, Inspector, to the body in the trunk, to Miss... Josephine Potts. I can't tell you the exact date, gentlemen, but I am sure it is early 18th century. I'll be with you in a moment. Intrigued, Mr. Holmes? Once I take an interest in something, Mr. Werner, I never lose it. Sorry we couldn't deliver in time. Dr. Watson was most disappointed. Or perhaps I'll buy it for him as a Christmas present. If it's still here. If you're still here. You think I killed that girl, Mr. Holmes, don't you? First the girl, then Jenkins. For what reason? The girl? Who knows? Was she threatening to become a social embarrassment to you? So I deposit her body in a trunk and send a good friend to collect it. Not a friend. A rival. Who would undoubtedly hang. 
Had not his fiancée appealed for help to the greatest detective of our time? Of all times. What is this exquisite piece called? The artist left it untitled. Any suggestion? What about Josephine Potts? It is more optic than personal, surely. What do you think of Foyle? You thought if you got rid of Courtney, Lady Helen would marry you. She was once very fond of you. Your information is incorrect, Mr. Holmes. And whatever you accuse me of, you know quite well. You can prove nothing. We continue patiently with our inquiries. As Inspector Lestrade might say, that's standard procedure. I thought of a title for this magnificent work of art. One death too many. <laughs> checked everywhere. Nothing. Even the house in Peckham was rented by Mrs. Potts herself. All payments for everything were made in cash. No one even knew the name of the man who visited her or what he looked like. Mrs. Potts. Did you say Mrs. Potts? Yes, we didn't know. At first she called herself Miss. But she was married to a man called Henry Potts. A very violent man with a long criminal record. Ran off to Australia, I believe. Well, she must have told Werner about him. Well, that wouldn't give us the evidence we need to convict him. Well, I thought he'd kill two birds with one stone, but perhaps one of those birds is a phoenix. What's a phoenix? It's a mythical bird that rises from its own ashes. That's exactly what it is. And we must create our own myth. Courtney is the victim of a charade staged by Werner. We must stage our own charade. We must fight one lie with another lie. I personally do not believe that Courtenay killed that young lady. Well, that's very loyal and commendable of you, Mr. Werner. Now, here is the sketch of Miss Potts, drawn by one of our police artists. Did she ever come here to the gallery to visit Mr. Courtenay? I don't believe so. No. I never seen her here. Or anywhere else. Or anywhere else. We have learned that she had a husband who disappeared some time ago. He has been described as a dangerous man with a vicious temper. You mean he might have killed her? Well, we might have to consider it. But that wouldn't explain how Courtney had the ticket in his pocket. No, it wouldn't, but we'd have to reconsider the case against Mr. Courtney. I understand. They're burying Mrs. Potts tomorrow. Would you have any objection to attending the service? What purpose would that serve, Inspector? Well, you might recognize someone you'd seen here at the gallery. Someone who spoke to Courtney. Might give us a new lead. But I don't see... You do want to help Mr. Courtney, don't you, Mr. Verner? If I can, certainly. The burial is at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Josephine never mentioned her husband to you? I told him the murderer might be here. What are you playing at home? Says he'll tear the coward limb from limb. I believe him as well. He's got a nasty record. He'll have to wait till the result of the trial then. He doesn't strike me as having that kind of patience. Anyway, I told him it was you. Now, listen. It's all right. I haven't pointed you out yet. If you'd like to confess the truth, I won't. That's blatant blackmail. To counter blatant murder. Interesting situation, Mr. Werner. If you plead insanity or come up with a convincing excuse, a jury might believe you. It won't work with Henry Potts, though. 
he'll kill you. He'll find you, Mr. Turner. It was an accident. I didn't mean to kill her. She fell down the stairs. I panicked. under the name of Hercules Higgins of Hackney. Well, he played the part beautifully. Oh, all good wrestlers are good actors.
Tarleton Manor was one of those spacious country houses built in the last century for large families with an extensive staff of servants. Now, only two people resided there. The railway millionaire and one-time foreign minister, Lord Tarleton, and his wife. Having earned his fortune and achieved a place in history, Lord Tarleton was now passionately interested only in the occult, in spiritualism, in the phenomena of life after death. Tonight, he was to make another attempt to communicate with the other world. And he would succeed. Sherlock Holmes, I presume. You presume correctly. Morton, our Hadlock solicitor. Quite, may I come in? I would be honored. Mr. Hadlock, my friend and associate, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Yes, do. Please sit down. Thank you. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I come on a sad errand. A sad errand. Indeed. This letter was written by Lord Tarleton, whose legal affairs I've had the honor of handling for a number of years, three years ago. He gave it to me, instructing me to deliver it to you, but only after his death. He died last night. I'm very sorry to hear it, Mr. Hadlock. I had the pleasure of meeting Lord Tarleton on several occasions. He was a most eminent figure. I had no better client. Are you familiar with the contents of this letter? My instructions were to hold it and deliver it, not to read it. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, dear sir, as you now know, I am dead. But as I write this to you, I have no idea where or how I shall die. I recognize that during my long career in government and industry, I have made many enemies. I respectfully request that you investigate the circumstances surrounding my death, no matter how I died. I hereby give you full permission in regard to both my personal and business affairs to take any and all steps you deem necessary to learn the truth. With sincere thanks, from wherever I am now, I remain faithfully yours, Tout. Extraordinary in his later years. Lord Tarleton dabbled in spiritualism and clairvoyance and things of that nature. I wouldn't take that letter too seriously. This letter seems to have been written by a man in full control of his faculties. Lord Tarleton died of a heart attack. His personal physician, Dr. Rinaldo, signed a proper death certificate attesting that fact. That's your opinion as well? Certainly. Watson, I confess I am fascinated by this request. A man seeking the truth about his death from beyond the grave. What do you think? Well, you've had some unusual clients before, but never one who was dead. Mr. Hadlock, I will definitely investigate the matter. 
Lord Tarleton's will was to be read in the presence of all those who benefited from his death. If, as he feared, he had been murdered, one of them was his killer, and he believed he could help Holmes from his grave. To my beloved wife, Sylvia, I leave 50% of all my earthly possessions whatsoever, including investments, cash, and property of all kinds. To Arthur Smythe, my closest, most trusted business associate, 10% of my aforesaid earthly possessions. To Dr. Victor Rinaldo, my lifelong friend and physician, 10% of my possessions. To Elizabeth Hargrove, my delightful, precious ward, 10% of my possessions. And to Morton Hadlock, my invaluable and trusted solicitor, 10% of my possessions. And finally, to the British Institute of Parapsychology, 10% of my possessions for the furtherance of research into the occult sciences. There's a, a further note written in Lord Tarleton's own hand. At this moment, I am certain that Sherlock Holmes is here among you. He is so at my bidding. Please accord him your entire cooperation in anything he may require. Mr. Holmes, you're here because there's a possibility a crime has been committed. What do you make of the fact that we've all of us benefited from Lord Tarleton's death? Do you think any of us killed him? As a matter of fact, Lord Tarleton was murdered, and his murderer is sitting in this room. Do you realize what you're saying? Yes, Lady Tarleton, I realize what I'm saying. I certainly hope you do. Who did it? My investigation will be complete by the morning. At that time, with the last piece in place, I shall name the murderer. I have only one request. I should like to spend the night in the tower room. The tower room? Terribly uncomfortable. No matter. Please, spend the rest of the evening as you wish. You will not be subject to any further questioning. My investigation will proceed along quite different lines. Come, Watson. We have work to do. You know very well that you have no proof that Lord Tarleton was murdered and no evidence to incriminate any of these people. Quite right. What are you planning? I'm working on two opposing assumptions. One, if everyone is innocent, I have nothing to fear. And two, if someone amongst them did murder Lord Tarleton, it's quite possible I shall not survive the night. Good night. Holmes? If you need anything, Holmes, just call me. Good night, Watson. Sleep well. I can manage from here. Were there only candles to light the tower? My husband preferred it that way. He thought that modern gas illumination would frighten away the spirits that he was always trying to reach. I understand. Well, Mr. Holmes, do you still plan to name the murderer tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning, Lady Tarleton. Good night, Mr. Holmes. Good night.
Yes. What happened? I don't know. I came out to see if you were all right. I found the door locked. I broke in and found you unconscious on the floor. I tried to drag you out onto the landing, and then I passed out. Yes, someone locked me in. Were you feeling all right before you went to the tower room? Yes, perfectly. And something in there affected us, almost killed us. I'm not going back in. The answer. wind must have blown out the candles. Be careful, Watson. Someone or something may have entered the tower without our notice. But how? The room is so small. They've been treated with something. When lit, they release highly toxic fumes, and it wouldn't take long to fill a room this size. But who put them there? And who locked you in? The same person that killed Lord Tarleton. Here they are, Watson. Candles. Quite insupportable. Waiting for Holmes to pronounce one of us a murderer. Mm. Mr. Holmes has a reputation for solving crime. But this time, I don't think he'll succeed. Because there was no crime. I examined Lord Tarleton myself, you know that. Good morning. Holmes. You seem surprised to see me, Mr. Hadlock. No, not, not at all. It's my nerves that are a bit on edge. We've all spent a very painful night, Mr. Holmes. And would you be kind enough to relieve the tension and tell us exactly who it was who murdered my husband? I'm afraid I can't, Lady Tarleton. And I sincerely apologize. The fact is, an extraordinary thing occurred last night which will delay the naming of Lord Tarleton's murderer until tonight. What extraordinary thing occurred? I was contacted by the spirit of Lord Tarleton. I don't believe it. Such things are impossible. Are they? Well, what did he say to you? That he was indeed murdered. That one of you here is guilty. And that that person will be exposed tonight at midnight during a seance to be held in the tower. I expect you all to be there. I can't wait here all day. The office, I've got important things to attend to. I suggest there is nothing more important than the matter at hand. Well, you've already broken your promise to name my husband's murderer this morning. How are we to be sure that you'll keep this one? I've asked Dr. Watson to go to London to fetch Inspector Lestrade at Scotland Yard. When the murderer is revealed, I would like Lestrade to be on hand to make an official arrest. Well, naturally, Doctor, I'm always delighted to give Holmes a helping hand. But what you're asking is most irregular, not standard procedure at all. Does Holmes have any proof yet that Lord Tarleton was murdered? No. Does he know who committed the crime, assuming there was one? No. Holmes wants me to go out to Tarleton Manor, arrest the murderer of Lord Tarleton, assuming that he was murdered and that there is a murderer. Yes. Come now, Doctor. I can't act in an official capacity on such flimsy ground. I'm sorry. Inspector, last night someone tried to kill Holmes. Well, why didn't you say so? Come on. 
please, everyone, join hands. Thank you. Now create an image in your mind of Lord Tarleton. And concentrate intently upon it. Concentrate. Concentrate. whilst I light the mystic candle. Carlton, we are here gathered in accordance with your express wish to discover the individual who deliberately terminated your earthly existence. If you can hear me, Lord Tarleton, please signify by knocking three times. Now we ask that you materialize before us, materialize and indicate your murder. Materialize, materialize. How long is this going to take, Holmes? A few minutes, a few hours. We will wait. Please, uh, can we open up the window? It's so stuffy in here, I can hardly breathe. The window is stuck fast, Lady Tarleton. There is no way to open it. But at least open the door. We must have some fresh air. The door is locked, Dr. Rinaldo. Lord Tarleton insisted that the room be sealed during the seance. Mr. Holmes, you don't know what you're doing. We must have air. We must. Lady Tarleton, there's nothing to be alarmed about. But you don't understand. We will soon die, all of us. Die? How, Lady Tarleton? From what? The fumes, you fool! The fumes from the candles! They'll kill us all! Victor! Open the window! It's no use, Ronaldo. Victor! Ah! Here we are. The dome? The key. The door isn't locked, Lady Tarleton. The bolt is broken. And these candles aren't poisonous. Simply painted black to match the ones you and Dr. Rinaldo used to murder your husband. I'll take that, my lady. You tricked us. Yes, I did. This way, Lady Tolton. Poison candle? This one. And this one is just an ordinary candle simply painted black. You're certain? Positive. Well, why didn't we just light them in the street? Perfectly safe so long as we leave the window, door open, and have a current of air passing through. And you want to prove which one burns the faster? Could be a valuable piece of information. In case anyone's tempted ever to use one of these candles again. Exactly. Now, let's examine the wicks on these two candles. This one's the poisoned one. This one is safe. Here, look through the glass. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Inspector. We'll be with you in a moment. There's no rush. I was just passing. The wick on this candle is thicker than the other. Yes, by adding poison to the wax, it reduces the candle's ability to burn and therefore requires a thicker wick. Extraordinary 
how so simple an instrument can be so deadly. Yes. Did you just light your cigar from one of those candles? Yes. Anything wrong? Which one? Well, that one. Or that one, one of the two. Holmes, one moment, Watson. Three, four, five. Holmes, seven, eight. Then comes nine, then comes ten. What are you two doing? You used the candle on your right. Yes, I think I did. How did you guess? Just one of Holmes's lucky guesses. But I have one of mine. And just to be on the safe side, light it with a match this time. Well, thank you very much, Doctor. You should never light a cigar with a candle. Leaves a nasty taste in the mouth. Shortly before Christmas, and we'd been forced to move to an hotel for a few weeks. The price one had to pay for modern conveniences. Gaslight and a new dumb waiter were being installed in Baker Street. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, my career is finished. I beg your pardon. Finished. Completely finished. Disgraced. Ruined. Who are you? I am Monsieur Baron. Uh, hotel manager at your service. Of course. How do you do? I do very badly. Thank you. What's the matter? I'm going to kill myself. Probably with a knife or a gun. And they will send my body back to my beloved Switzerland, where there are no cat burglars. Cat burglars? Do you mean somebody's stolen a cat? He means a burglar who moves and climbs like a cat, not one who steals them. Mr. Holmes, you are a man of the world. You are clever. You are genius. Genius? What? Genius. Oh, yes, Baron, genius. So you will take... I will not. I was going to say... I know. How do you know? I am a genius, but I will not take your case. You mean... If I pay? It's not a matter of money. Not money? But, Mr. Holmes, 
What can I offer you? Peace, Monsieur Baron. Peace. Mr. Holmes, I've been sending you messages. I have a terrible problem. Yes, madame, you have. For six years, my darling, other loved me with passion. A month ago, she went out to buy a cigar. And never came back. You are a genius. How did you know? Geniuses know these things. What should I do? I suggest you go to your room and... Yes? Wait for him there. Isn't he wonderful? Wonderful. Mm. Wonderful genius. Here they are. Lady Knowles, Sir Oliver Duncan, may I introduce my new friends, Dr. John Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? How do you do? Sir Oliver was just telling us about the launching of his newest ship, the Star of Mara. The Star of Mara? Is that a celestial star? No, it's actually a sapphire. Named after the Temple of Mara in India. It was given to my grandfather many years ago. An ancient sapphire. It sounds mysterious. It sounds romantic. A bit of both. It's supposed to bring good luck. And has it? It's done well for itself. Is it sealed in the ship? Oh, no. For the spell to work, it must be kept close at hand. Then don't wear it around your neck, Sir Oliver. Or the cat burglar will steal it. She stole my ruby. I'm so sorry for you, Lady Knowles. Thank you, my dear. But at least it was insured. After a fashion. How do you mean, after a fashion? It's unfair to discuss burglars and crime in Mr. Holmes's presence. His stay here is a form of holiday, I believe. After a fashion, but I've no objection to discussing crime, Lady Knowles. You're sweet. But how can one... Ensure something after a fashion. If Mr. Holmes knows the answer and wishes to discuss it, he has my permission. Lady Knowles Ruby was one of the famous matched pair. Separately, their value is considerably diminished. Of course. He didn't take them both. It's magnificent. If the cat burglar comes to your room tonight, my dear, I forbid you to tell him about it. <laughs> well, I'm going to leave your children. At my age, it's time for a nap. Dr. Watson, why don't you catch the cat burglar? I? Well, you've worked with Mr. Holmes on cases before. Well, I like to believe, but I've... You're assisted. probably just as good as he is. In many ways, far better. You catch him. Let's get my ruby back. She's extraordinary. Well, I think it's a wonderful idea, Dr. Watson. You must know a great deal about catching criminals. Well, I like to think that uh, I'm not unfamiliar with the criminal mind. How would you start? Start? Yes, how would you go about catching the thief? Well, I'd start by studying the modus operandi. There, you see. I must run upstairs. Dr. Watson's very kindly offered to give my brother Jonathan a fencing lesson. I want to make certain he's finished his homework. I'll accompany you. I have one or two important matters to attend to. I'll see you later, Holmes. Sir Oliver? Do you believe Dr. Watson can... It's easier for a woman to keep a large, precious stone at hand. Yes, and don't underestimate this cat burglar. He's clever. Very, very clever. We are delighted to see you again, Miss Morton. Your suite is exactly as you ordered it. Do you know her? No, but the manager considers her an invitation to the cat burglar. Perhaps you should keep an eye on her then. Perhaps I should. Hello, Dr. Watson. Claire says Jonathan will be a little late. 
He didn't finish his homework. I haven't even started it. But they say he's very intelligent. He is more intelligent than me. Well, you almost beat me at chess yesterday. It's always almost, Dr. Watson. It's been like that all my life. If I come back in time, can I watch you and Jonathan Fence? Of course, but where are you going, my dear? I went to see a doctor. Doctor? I sleepwalk at night. Well, that's not unusual. All children, uh, all young ladies, usually outgrow it. I know, but it frightens Miss Emmy. Miss Emmy? Our governess. Of course. Victoria! Victoria! <sighs> Coming, Miss Emmy! Remember, Victoria, if you need me, I'm a doctor, too. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Oh! Yes. Touche? Yes. Touche, I think. Yes. attack, you should return to the on-guard position a little faster. A little faster? Yes. And the distance between your feet should be a little greater. Well, it gives you the possibility to change direction with less preparation. Feet closer together. Do you play chess? Yes. Would you like to play? No. Child, he's a midget. And he's 90 years old. The Mrs. Morton arrived at the hotel. She's rather flamboyant. Are you referring to her jewelry? Claire says that she'll be the cat burglar's next victim. You should arrange with the manager to put an extra guard on her floor. I already have. Claire has suggested it. <laughs> I know, but I'm very worried about my little sister. Oh, yes, her sleepwalking. I'll escort you to your room. Are you leaving already, Miss Ryland? Good evening to you. Good evening, Sir Oliver. I've been meaning to speak to you about Victoria. The doctor said there was really nothing we could do. Well, I expected that. However, there are certain new techniques that have been tested in France. Really? Could you tell me about it? Well, certainly. I'm doing a round of the alternatives. Trying to catch the cat right now. Perhaps I can escort you to your suite. Yes. I'm very anxious to hear about these new techniques. Thank you for a lovely evening, Sir Oliver. Yeah, we're having lunch tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. Dr. Watson, Sir Oliver. I imagine that the doctor said that if Victoria walked in her sleep, she mustn't be awakened. Yes, all the doctors have said that. But tell me, what is this new French technique? Oh, I'm afraid there aren't any new techniques. Why, Dr. Watson, you lied to me. A small one. I wanted to walk you to your door. A white lie. Are you angry? Should I be? I don't think so. I'm not. I'm very pleased. What a dear thing to say. Do be careful, John. If anything unusual occurs, use your whistle. Yes, sir. And if 
the little Ryland girl should come out of her room number 14, she must on no account be awakened. I understand, sir. Perfect. couldn't have happened. There's no possible way for it to happen, but it did happen. This is my first case and you're not even interested. I am interested. Well, you don't look interested. I'm only waiting for you to stop telling me that it couldn't have happened. Yes, you're right. I'm not being constructive. I'm being emotional. All right. I'll tell you the facts exactly as they were described to me. The windows and the door to Lady Knowles' room were locked from the inside. This morning, the door was still locked. She found her key on the floor, but she believes she dropped it in her excitement. Strangely, her window was open. But the guards in the street below and those in the corridor swear no one entered the room. You the thief. No, but you're thinking correctly. No one is above suspicion. I know that. I've even suspected the guards. And Lady Noel, and Victoria, and our governess. Who? Claire's little sister, I've told you, is a somnambulist. She was sleepwalking last night, but the governess followed her like a shadow. And at no time were they out of sight of the guards. How did you know? If there had been, you would have said so. They would have been your prime suspects. Yes, of course. Whenever you remove the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, is the truth. I know you disapprove, but it's such a challenge. Oh! I know you're laughing at me, but I find it a challenge. I'm not laughing at you, and keep still. You think I should leave with you right away? Yes. You think I should stop playing the amateur detective? 
All professionals were once amateurs. I promise I'll leave tonight. Take the jewels and have Jacob drive you to the house and then have him wait for me on the corner at Brompton Road. I promise that if I haven't solved the case by midnight, I'll stop making a fool of myself. Enjoy yourself. Please excuse me for a moment. Certainly, my dear. not to leave the room. Would you please ask Sir Oliver to see me? Sir Oliver? Yes. I'll get him myself. You can put a guard at the door. I will. Sir Oliver will see Miss Ryland for five minutes. You will lock the door behind him. And under no circumstances will Miss Ryland leave the room. My dearest. Or any other creature of the female species. John Watson is a beast. He knows my feelings for you. And this is his revenge. Help me. Anything. Anything at all. Please. Turn your head a little this way. My head? Price, Mr. Holmes, but you must take the case. If I were to take it, it would probably be the shortest case of my career. What do you mean? We know who the criminal is, so there is really no mystery to solve. The mystery is how we're to recover our valuables. That mystery will be solved almost immediately. What do you mean, almost immediately? Now. Package for you, Mr. Holmes. 
And how is the young lady who gave it to you? Beautiful, Governor. Beautiful. It's addressed to Lady Noel and Sir Oliver Duncan. It's a special note to me saying, I've so enjoyed meeting you all. I've kept one of the rubies for good luck. My very best wishes for the new year and a special warm thought for my dear friend, John. Anything the matter, Mr. Walton? Bemis, don't tell anybody, but my life is in danger. Huh? I've received threats, violent threats. This just came for you, Mr. Walton. Bad news, sir? The worst. My death sentence. Captain? Ah, uh, yes. Sir! We can expect a visitor. Good morning, sir. I've come to see Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I've been expecting you. Please come in. Oh, you mean exactly. Mr. Holmes, my name is Christopher Walton. How do you do? How do you do? Do you know the meaning of corpus delecti? I believe so. Absence of a body, am I right? A man cannot be considered dead or murdered, as the case may be, without a corpse being produced as prima facie evidence. You seem very familiar with the law, Christopher. A hobby of yours? Career, sir. I plan to be a barrister when I grow up. 
and I don't believe in wasting time. If you are late leaving the post, the odds are you will end up last. That's very true. Forgive me, young man. But would you mind telling us why you're here? Of course I wouldn't mind. That's why I'm here. Sir, according to Scotland Yard, my father was murdered last night. But his body has not been produced, a clear example of corpus delecti. And so I'm not convinced he's dead. Come, Christopher, sit down. I'd like to learn what happened. Please. Tell me everything you know. But that's all I know. Mr. Holmes, I've come here to ask you to find my father and bring him back home. Mum's been crying all day, and I miss him very much. I'll do everything I can, Christopher. It would help us if you could tell us something about your father. What his name is, what he does for a living. His name is George Pierce Wharton. And what he does is... To tell the truth, I'm not exactly sure what he does. The way Dad explains it, he's an independent entrepreneur. Does he invest money in different enterprises? Yes, he does. He's particularly interested in fine animals, horses, dogs, and in armaments. Armaments? I once heard him say he likes to put his money on shots that are long, something like that. I presume he was referring to some kind of artillery shell. Possibly. Is there anything else you'd like to know, Mr. Holmes? No, no, that will be all for now. I'll be getting in touch with Scotland Yard for some more information. Uh, Mr. Holmes, there's another reason why I know my father is still alive. Yes? It's that, well, my father is a good man. He's kind and generous, and he always tries to make me and Mum happy. He's the best father in the world, and I can't believe anyone would want to hurt him. If you knew him, you'd know I was telling the truth. I don't doubt you, Christopher. Thank you, sir. Here's my address in case you want me. In two pounds six. Two pounds six? What's that for? Your fee. Oh, that won't be necessary, Christopher. I'll be no, glad. No, sir. To... Your time and energy are valuable, and I believe in quid pro quo. That's Latin for a fair exchange. I am familiar with the phrase. Please, sir, take it. I wouldn't feel right otherwise. Very well, but two pounds six is far too much. One pound will be quite enough. It's a deal. It's a deal. Well, it's all here. Three employees of the Green Briar Club say that George Wharton was afraid of being killed. There was a violent struggle in the street, and he was abducted. Here's his hat, found at the scene of the crime, with his name imprinted in the band. And over here, his top coat, with the name George Wharton stitched in the lining. The river patrol found it floating in the Thames. Now, if you look closely, you will see that there is a bullet hole right over the heart. The body, Inspector. Where's the body? The patrol are dragging the Thames. It's only a matter of time. And until then, you can't state conclusively that George Wharton was murdered. Well, why are you two so interested in the case? Was Wharton a friend of yours? Indirectly. Well, I shouldn't bother if I were you. It's merely a routine murder. Do you have any idea who murdered Wharton or why? Well, naturally. <laughs> Just down here. It says that, um, um, <clears throat> well, as a, as a matter of fact, there don't seem to be any, any clues as to these minor matters, but my men will dig something up. It's only a matter of time. Some people can't wait that long. <laughs> Back to Baker Street? No, we're going to the Fitzgerald Prize Fighting Club. Why the Fitzgerald Sporting Club? Firehouse Percy. <laughs> Ready? 
struck by a succession of hard blows and fell down. Mr. Holmes, I didn't know you were here. Did you see me fight? I'm afraid I did. Uh, my friend and associate, Dr. Watson. Hello, Hello Doc. Oh. Listen carefully. We need some vital information, and you may be just the person to supply it. Anything I can do, Mr. Holmes. You know that. Have you ever heard of a man called George Wharton? Georgie Wharton? Sure. Too bad about what happened to him. What exactly do you mean by that? He got knocked out. Like for a permanent count of ten. Forever. We were aware that he was missing, not that he was dead. Missing? Dead? When you owe Jack Driscoll a hundred pounds, it amounts to the same thing. Driscoll, he's the bookmaker, isn't he? He's the biggest and also the meanest. Are you implying that Driscoll murdered Walton for non-payment of the gambling debt? Now, wait a minute. I'm not accusing Driscoll. All I'm saying is that round here, when someone walks us on him, we start making a collection for some flowers. You know where we can find this, Driscoll? The races at Wellsgate. Go to the two furlong post, and you'll find a fat man in a green suit, smoking a cigar with a watch in his hand. Why? Who are you? I'm Dr. Watson. This is Sherlock Holmes. Oh, so you're Sherlock Holmes. What, do you come in to place a bet? You could say that. I'm betting you can tell me where I can find George Watson. Try the bottom of the river, but don't get the ideas that I put him there. Others think you might have. Look, when a client is late checking his account, I treat him very gently. Might break his arm or his leg. And that's all. I don't know where I've got this reputation for killing people. Mr. Driscoll, we've been engaged to find Mr. Wharton, and we'd appreciate your cooperation. Oh, I don't know. Can't help you. He's dead. You really believe that? Well, Scotland Yard think he's dead. And I'm short of a hundred quid. Nevertheless, in the unlikely event of Scotland Yard being wrong, where do you think he'd choose to sequester himself? What? Remove himself from the public eye, so to speak. How would I know? I'm sure you're a man with a profound knowledge of how gamblers' minds work. No doubt you could write a book on the subject if you chose to. Well, not a whole book. Ah, let me see now. Let me see. A man like Wharton. Ah, the Four Leaf Clover Hotel. A very discreet place for small-time gamblers. No questions asked, if you know what I mean. You're a gentleman and an author, Mr. Driscoll, as well as a bookmaker. I'll take it. That will be four shillings in advance. Thank you. Thank you. Holmes, why in the world do you want to rent a miserable little room like this? There's a chance that Wharton may have left something here that would indicate his next destination. Rooms of this sort are rarely cleaned thoroughly. Someone's laundry list dated three months ago. This is the half page of the Times. Dated three years ago. Keep looking. Sailing schedule for the Great Atlantic Steamship Lines. Somebody circled round at the Fortune. RMS Glen Castle. Sailing for New York tomorrow. Excellent, Watson. We discovered our next port of call. Come on. You mean we're going to New York? George Walton. Yes, he's reserved a state from on tomorrow night sailing. State room. Has he paid for his ticket yet? No, just a five pound deposit. And how much more remains to be paid? Forty pounds. Due tomorrow morning. Thank you. You've been most helpful. Very good, Holmes. All we have to do is come back here tomorrow morning, intercept him, and then return him to his family. I'm afraid we have more to do than that, Watson. Hmm? 
clear now that Wharton engineered his so-called murder to avoid paying Driscoll the hundred pounds. We now have to prevent him from doing something he will regret forever and that will destroy young Christopher as well. On me is to laugh. I promise not to laugh. Now come on out. I promise not to laugh. I'm only smiling. Ah, that must be him now. Good day, Mr. Holmes. I came as soon as I got the message. Thank you, Powerhouse. Ah, he looks familiar. We met earlier today. Oh, yeah. Hello, Doc. What did you want to see me about, Mr. Holmes? I think it's time you won a fight. Me? You can do it, Powerhouse. Your problem is that you move your body and throw your punches exactly as fighters have been doing for the last 50 years. But if you were to learn some new techniques and methods, you'd be unbeatable. But who would teach me these things? I would, with the assistance of Dr. Watson. Against my better judgment, I assure you. But I can't understand why it is you want to help me. I want to bet on you and win 200 pounds. <laughs> I'd rather break. The 200 pounds, please, Mr. Driscoll. We're in a bit of a hurry. Now the top coat. Yeah. Now what do we see? bullet holes in separate places. Well, naturally, that's because Dr. Watson's standing in a straight up and down position. But let us suppose that Wharton was... Uh, doctor, would you mind raising your left arm? A, a little more. Now, twist your body to the right. and slump a little. There. The bullet holes line up. And that's how he was standing when he was shot? Well, it's not a normal everyday position. Thank you, Watson. Wharton wasn't murdered. Well, why did he pretend to be dead? 
Because a dead man doesn't have to pay his gambling debts. Gambling. Inspector, what gambling debt? We don't have time to explain. He must now prevent Wharton from really committing a crime. A hold-up that will net him at least enough to pay for a steamship ticket. <laughs> I say. What is all this about, officer? You haven't yet explained. I have him, Inspector. What? Hurry! Inspector, this is Archibald Mertz, also known as the Snake, a vicious international spy sent here to steal state secrets. I'm being Mr. Barman. That's what they all say. Take him away, Inspector. You sure you know what you're talking about, Holmes? Absolutely. All right, Snake. Come out. Officer! Lock this man in the wagon. Come along, sir. Let me go. Let me go. You're all mad. I'm not a spy. I tell you, I'm not a spy. I'm being Mr. Palmer. And this is Mr. George Wharton. Her Majesty's secret service. No! Will somebody please explain? And you too are to be congratulated, Mr. Driscoll. What? You see, Christopher, your father had to pretend he'd been murdered in order to close the trap on that spy. Isn't that so, Mr. Wharton? Uh, yes. And in recognition of his outstanding service, Her Majesty the Queen has asked me to present you with a special reward of 200 pounds. You know what to do with the money, don't you? Your associate, Mr. Driscoll, also risked his life in bringing this most dangerous mission to a successful conclusion. Naturally, you'll share the money with him. Oh, well, um, a hundred pounds for Mr. Driscoll. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Driscoll. Your, uh, <clears throat> your help was invaluable. What? Especially when you broke the snake's code. What? Oh, Dad, I'm so proud of you. What? Of course, this was a special once-in-a-lifetime mission. Mr. Wharton will once again find gainful employment and work as a normal, ordinary citizen. Isn't that right, Mr. Wharton? Oh, swear it. Well, I see no reason to detain you two any further. I'm sure you've got a great deal to talk about. Yes, sir. Uh, good night. And thank you. Mr. Driscoll will join you on the way out. My thanks to you, too, Mr. Driscoll. Holmes, you never ceased to amaze me. I had no idea this was going on. Why didn't you tell me? Surprise, Inspector. It's the wellspring of spontaneity. Well, you certainly surprised me. I believe I made one small error. What's that? That was not Archibald Mertz, the international spy. It was be Mr. Barman. I suggest you release him at once. But I've just arrested him. If you hadn't arrested him, you couldn't release him. That makes sense, doesn't it, Inspector? Yes, it makes sense. I knew you'd see it that way. You're a good man, Lestrade. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Good morning, Christopher. I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate what you did. It's a pleasure working for you. That story about my father being a secret agent, I know you made it up. Made it up? I assure you, Christopher. But... That's all right, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure he'll never gamble again. Gamble? What made you I think... I want to thank you too, Dr. Watson. Are you sure you don't want to reconsider your future and become a detective instead of a barrister? No, thank you. It's too late for me to start becoming a detective now. I'm already far along in my legal studies. Ah, yes, 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 of course. There's just one final thing to settle. The matter of your fee. I've decided the one pound isn't enough for your efforts. Here's the other one pound six. No, no, I insist. We made a deal, remember? 
but it wasn't a fair deal for you. Nevertheless, a deal is a deal. Now run along. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Andy. Thank you. Goodbye, Christopher. Goodbye. One day, that boy is going to become Prime Minister. I believe it comes to one pound six. 